Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, good morning, uh, Brisbane. The previous talk, if you have seen it, the future of programming, I think that's over. Um, so the message I'm going to give you today is like we're probably the last generation of developers that actually write code. Um, and yeah, it's kind of sad, but also exciting. Um, and my talk is called, um, uh, well, it has the other title, but this is kind of like what I want to talk about, like Hinton's Nightmare is my dream. Um, now, this title can be interpreted in several ways. Um, Hinton's Nightmare is my dream, or Hinton's Nightmare is my dream, or Hinton's Nightmare is my dream. Well, it's all up to you to decide after this talk how you interpret it. Um, but this is uh, kept like, you know, what, um, what it refers to. So Hinton is uh, considered to be by some the kind of father of AI, um, but now he's gotten a little bit cold feet um, and went from an optimist to a doomer. Um, and one of the things that he mentioned is that um, AI systems might escape control by writing their own computer code to modify themselves. But as a developer, isn't that exciting? Like having an AI that writes computer code itself such that we don't have to write it ourselves um, so that we can party all day, surf, I don't know what, but like not write code. If the robots can write code, we as humans shouldn't have to write it. So I think this is great. I, I don't see why, why this is a danger. It, it, I think it's, it's all fun. Um, so, but you can ask yourself, how is it possible that we went from like this optimism of the future, like flying cars, AI, that will do everything, to this doom scenario where we're afraid of AI? And um, how did that happen? Um, and to do that, let's look a little bit into the past. I think it's always good to, to look in the past um, to interpret the future. Um, and when I was a PhD student a long, long time ago in the 80s, um, I, this is when there was also, I, I don't know, I think it was a very optimistic time actually. A Japanese started something called the Japanese fifth generation project. Um, at that point, like, you know, fourth generation programming languages were all the hype. Um, and the Japanese came out with fifth generation and they built special hardware for AI. It was all based on logic programming and Prolog. Um, and people believed that um, using math, um, that would be the way to, to, to do AI. Um, so as a young PhD student, I thought, oh, this is great. Um, because um, the reason I started to do computer science was to get, like, you know, automate ourselves away. Um, and if we could do that with AI, even better. But it was all way too difficult. Um, and then I said, ah, this AI stuff is never going to work. Instead of natural language, let me go and do programming languages. And that was what the, um, the interest speaker said, but really me doing programming language was just a cop out because I was too lazy to do, to do this difficult AI. Um, so for a long time, I did programming languages. Sorry for that. Um, and then in around 2017, I saw that the folks that stuck with AI were having a lot of fun. They kind of suddenly could use neural networks to recognize cats and it was I, things went really fast, where the programming language community was talking about C++, 11, or, or 20, Java, 18, and it was all moving at a snail's pace because even though it's, it is Java, whatever, 25, it's still just Fortran with a different syntax. So nothing was really happening in the programming language space. Um, and so I said, okay, fuck it. I'm going to switch back to AI. Um, and then um, I wanted to have, like, you know, go back and use AI to do uh, programming. Um, but let's look like even further back. 
be, um, to like, what is it, 1956, when a couple of smart people um, got together for the summer and said, let's kind of, like, solve this um, AI problem in a few months and we're done. Um, and like famous last words, right? Like, you know, like this is, it, it's universal. So um, I, I kind of don't believe that this doom scenario will happen really fast. It won't happen over summer. Uh, but anyway, let, let's still look at, like, you know, I think how much the AI has improved since the 80s. So when I was doing um, AI in the 80s, one big thing was non-monotonic logic. And people were talking about this, like mathematicians, philosophers. Um, you can all read about this um, um, on the web, but let's kind of like, you know, boil it down to the kind of like simple example. Um, and if I tell you kind of like, you know, that Tweety is a bird, then you can like probably conclude, oh, Tweety is a bird, birds can fly, hence Tweety can fly. But then when I tell you that Tweety was a penguin, or probably there's like, you know, all kind of weird Australian birds that can, cannot fly, um, maybe I should say Tweety is Australian, that you say, oh, of course, now it cannot fly. But that means that you have to retract previous conclusions and that's what mon non-monotonic means. Um, so here, here's it. But let's ask a chat GPT um, this same question. Um, so if you ask uh, chat GPT, Tweety is a bird, can it fly? What you see, it already starts to get like, oh, yeah, mm, mm, I think this is a trick question. Maybe it can fly, maybe not. It can fly a little bit. Um, and then, you say it's a penguin, and then of course, ChatGPT said, oh Eric, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake, it cannot fly, it's a penguin. Um, but then when you ask it to explain um, why it made a conclusion and now have to retract the conclusion, I think it really shows um, that um, it understands um, this non-monotonic reasoning. Um, so I do think that the, the AIs have, have come quite, quite far. Um, and before this, like, you know, this was like an open research problem. And now this standard large language model uh, can reason about uh, non-monotonic logic. All right, as I said, I moved back to doing AI. Um, and um, I looked at um, AI for software engineering. Um, and why is that? Well, um, I like to look at feedback loops. Um, and one of the like, interesting feedback loops that we have in industry that drives uh, Moore's law is the feedback loop between hardware and software. Um, and this is an amazing feedback loop, actually. Um, so software, we can use software to design hardware. And when we have hardware, that gets faster, we can get, like, you know, write more powerful software. When we have more powerful software, we can build more powerful hardware. And now we get this very, like this virtuous cycle that kind of, like, you know, drives everything. And, and that allows like computing power to double every whatever time, time slot um, you want. But there's also uh, vicious cycles. And this is one of the vicious cycles um, that software encounters. If you look at the business, the, a business is enabled by software, but then when the business grows, it gets complicated, and now the software gets more complicated. Um, somehow we manage to deal with that. The business grows, gets even more complicated. Now we have to get, like, spend more energy to build the software. And so it, this is not really kind of like a virtuous cycle, but it's the complexity of the software that's kind of slowing things down. Um, now we think we're all smart, and so what we do is we say, let's invent Agile, let's invent Scrum, twice the work and half the time. Um, and so we built this little um, virtuous cycle um, as a flywheel uh, next to the uh, vicious cycle. So um, when we um, create software, now we can build software tools. 
like Kanban boards and whatever great tools that will allow us to kind of write software faster. Um, and now we can create even better tools. And so we have this little virtuous cycle on the side that helps us to overcome the uh, vicious cycle on the left. Now, you, of course, you all know that I'm a big fan of software engineering and processes and agile. Um, and so my real goal in life is to eliminate, to destroy this. I want to get rid of that. Um, so how do we do that? Um, well, still having a virtuous cycle where we can grow the business using software. Well, the trick is actually quite simple. Replace software with AI. Um, and this has like one big side effect that we can eliminate um, software engineering and processes. Um, and the other side effect is that we get this virtuous cycle. And why is this a virtual cycle? Well, um, AI will enable the business. The business will grow. It will generate more data. For normal software, that was complexity that, that made our lives harder. But for AI, it's great because this is training data. So now we get more training data. So the AI gets more powerful. The business can grow. And by eliminating software and replacing it with AI, we get um, a, a, a nice um, virtuous cycle. Uh, but again, it also, and maybe that's my main goal, it frees us from this craziness of Agile and Scrum. All right. So let's go and, and look what we did here. Um, so we looked at three things, um, code search, code recommendations, and automatic bug fixing. Um, and we felt so proud when we wrote this paper. This paper uh, won a best paper award. Uh, but then November 30th, 2022, anybody recognize that date? That was the day that ChatGPT came out. And that's when I discovered that all this work that we did for all those years with a lot of smart PhDs and machine learning specialists was all wiped out in one day. Um, all the things that we worked on really hard and, and built special models for could now be solved by a single general purpose model. Um, so let's look at, look at some examples. So one thing was code search using natural language. Um, so one of the things that we did, um, you heard it maybe in the previous talk, um, you use embeddings to do this, this search. Um, but of course, we thought, oh, code, code is different than natural language. Code has structure. Code has scoping rules, variable declarations, control flow. So let's create special embeddings that understand code. Um, which we did, and now you could get, like, you know, do code search, um, semantic code search. Um, interestingly, um, when we released this, people were actually pissed. They didn't like it at all because they said, I want to search for class foo, and you don't get, like, return class foo. You return, like, another class bar that does the same as class foo, but I want to search for class foo. Um, so what people really wanted was kind of like, you know, text search or, um, I don't know, like just like whatever you, you go to definition in the IDE. People didn't want to do semantic search. But now, of course, a few years later, everybody wants uh, semantic search. Um, so let's look at um, an example. Um, this is one of our benchmark examples. How, how do you write a circular buffer in hack? Um, Hack is, by the way, Facebook's um, PHP uh, variant. Um, you kind of like, you know, if you want to search for this, you don't know what the class name is called and so on. So this is a, a really good reason why you want to have semantic search. Is I don't know what the classes are called, but I do know what kind of like thing I'm looking for. Um, now, w when we did semantic search, we found existing code. Um, the beauty of these LLMs is it will give you an implementation of a circular buffer in hack, but
but you don't even know if that was existing code or that it will generate it for you. So it's even better than, than search, right? Because it can also synthesize code for you. And so again, like hop, like all this work wiped out in one day. Next one is code recommendations. Um, and this is um, like, of course, you all write documentation and so on, but typically most developers don't read document, uh, write documentation, um, but you do want to encourage good practices. So for example, if you're using this API, this bitmap factory, um, that must be a Java API. Um, now, you, in order to use that, you have to get, like, put some try catch blocks around it. Um, so the question is, how do I safely use this API? And now you want the tool to tell you, oh, you need to get, like, surround it um, with this try catch statement. And again, um, lots of work that we did now just done out of the box by ChatGPT. Last one was automatic bug fixing. Um, of course, um, super important. If you can write sloppy code and you have like a tool fix your bugs for you, what else can you wish for, right? Um, so let's look at this. Um, fix the potential bug in this piece of code. Um, now the, the, the nice thing about um, ChatGPT here is that it does not only explain the bugs, uh, but it also uh, doesn't fix the bugs, but it also explains it for you. Uh, where in our case, um, we were just kind of like fixing bugs. One thing, however, that that um, ChatGPT doesn't do, which we we did, so the way we trained our models, like if you have like a code with bugs, and you have a code where the bug is fixed, now you have training data, right? So you have code with bugs code without bugs, and now you can train a model that takes a some piece of code with bugs and fixes the bugs for you. What is interesting, however, is that you can also train a model that goes the other direction. You can now give it a piece of code that has no bugs, and it can generate a piece of code with bugs. And you can ask yourself, why is that useful? Well, that is super useful, because how do you test your test suite? You test your test suite by injecting bugs into your code base and see if your test suite can detect that. And this automatic bugs, bug generation thing would really generate very nasty bugs. Um, but I'm pretty sure ChatGPT could do this well in the past. Probably now, if you ask it to generate a, a buggy program, it will say, oh, no, no, I cannot do that. That's not safe. Um, but I think it's very, very useful to have an ML system, an AI system, that can generate buggy code, because that allows you to uh, test your test suite. Um, all right. There's a bug. Oh, no. All right, let's go. So yeah, as I said, like, you know, we worked on this for many years, and then it really felt um, like we were digging tunnels with pickaxes and shovels, and then suddenly um, somebody showed up with, with dynamite and heavy machinery um, and completely destroyed all the work that we did. Uh, but that was good um, because it does mean that we can apply this AI not just to developer productivity, but also to general productivity. So what about other knowledge workers, right? So if if these standard models are so powerful and don't need special knowledge about code, we can also apply this to general productivity, and that's, um, that's what I'm doing. Um, now, talking about that, I, I do have to show this graph, because I think all of us here probably and maybe there's some self-taught programmers, maybe um, you went to college to study computer science, and you all thought like, oh, I'm smart, I studied hard, I have a real good job, will pay my mortgage, um, and more, like I can lead a lavish lifestyle um, forever because this coding thing is got, like future-proof. Um, but what we didn't realize is that AI is going after our jobs first, where 
the people that are actually got, like working with their hands, um, they are much harder to replace by AI. Um, I think developers, lawyers, um, those are, are the, the ones that will be wiped out first. Um, now, we can be sad about it, or we can be happy about it. And I think we should be happy about it. This is exciting. It's like it, a very, very short period in the history of mankind where we were writing code by hand. And we are right at this edge where we're switching from writing code by hand to not writing code, like having the machines write code. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, like a once in the gap, like, you know, like whatever, the universe opportunity. It's, it's extremely exciting. So let's not be doomish. Let's just take this opportunity um, and, and celebrate, right? Let's automate ourselves away and have fun doing it. Um, and yeah, I, I don't. I think if you're a real computer scientist, nothing can be more pleasurable than kind of like self-application, right? Applying all this stuff to yourself, and then let's let's get rid of our own jobs. Um, and I think these this time there's never been a better time to do that. Um, all right. So let's see how how are we going to to do that? How are we going to automate ourselves away? Um, and I look at this at a few kind of like layers of sophistication. So the first layer is um, like the first generation of Copilot, and uh, my team built something like this as well. It's called Code Compose. This is Facebook's version of, of Copilot, um, and that is really much nothing much more than AI-powered typing. But if you're typing your code, you kind of already know what you want to do, so it's not not a big productivity gain. If you, like, you know what code you want to write, the tool kind of helps you to get write it faster, that's not a transformational change. Um, and I think the, the co-pilot folks um, saw that because now you can chat with whatever AI in your IDE. Um, but still, that is kind of like still not very sophisticated. It's kind of like, you know, AI-powered search very similar to um, the examples that I showed you before that, that like, you know, that, that we did. Um, to really automate ourselves away, we have to let AI do like larger workflows. But think of what you're doing like, you know, day to day if you're, if you're writing code. That is like that bigger workflow, that's what we should automate away. Um, and then you, you can think about things like, you know, baby AGI, auto GPT, things like that, where the um, AI predicts the workflows that we're performing and then automates them away. Um, and maybe that's why people get scared, because if, if the AI can invent workflows, maybe it can invent a workflow where it can escape um, itself and so on. Um, but as long as, as, as ChatGPT cannot even generate well-formed JSON, I think that danger is, is not too bad. All right, so let's look at a, like, at a simple example where we're automating a workflow, but we, I as a human, define the workflow, but I use AI to implement pieces of it. Um, and this is a workflow, um, hopefully, should sound very familiar to many of you. Um, um, this is how I write code, test-driven development. I have some tests, I run them, um, if any test fails, I can, like, you know, hack on my code to make the test pass. Um, I try again. If the, there's more tests that fail, I hack some more on my code until all the tests succeed. When all the tests succeed, my job is done. But typically, my code has become quite ugly. So I kind of clean it up a little bit and call it quits, um, submit it into whatever the next tool for code reviews. Um, and then I take my next, my next task, right? Okay, so this is the uh, like loop. So let's look at each of these, how we can implement this and automate this using AI or, or not AI. Um, so let's look at um, each of these uh, things here. Um, and all these boxes 
are really on the outside. They're just traditional, I use Scotland here, they're traditional classes, but maybe the, the implementation can use a model. And I, I think in the transition period where we're kind of like integrating more and more um, AI into our workflows, but also into our code, this will be a common pattern. So on the outside, it looks like a regular class, but the implementation is done um, by calling out into a model. So in this case, the code fixer um, is something that like, you know, it takes uh, a, a piece of code and then it kind of like, you know, fixes it, but it is implemented by um, calling out to a language model. <laughs> All right. So far, I sounded really optimistic, but now it's time to be a little bit pessimistic. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that anyone of you that has tried to write prompts for, for a model, whether it's like you know, GPT or Llama or, or whatever model it is, um, we now go from a programming language that we kind of more or less understand to some weird form of English that we kind of like, like kind of try to convince this, this model to do what we want. Um, and what you see is that you're often begging the model, right? In this case, like, you know, you have to have like no language name because like sometimes if, if it generates code, I just wanted to put it in triple quotes, but I don't want it to put the language name there. Right? And so it's like you're, you're kind of like begging this machine or this model like, oh, please do this, please don't do that. I don't think that's actually a very um, effective way for humans to interact um, with computers and not with AIs. Um, so later, a few slides from now, um, I will talk about a new programming language that I'm defining that will kind of like be that we will use to kind of program these AIs because I don't think current prompting is the, is the way to go. This is like the assembly language. Of, of like human AI interaction. Um, anyway, um, so here's the, the code that I give it. I got kind of like called the bug fix agent. And in this case, there are kind of like, you know, a couple of um, syntax errors. Um, there's the unit tests. And by the way, the unit tests are also written by the model. I don't even wrote them myself. And in this case, um, it's the Kotlin compiler that finds the errors. Um, again, like you know, so it's not an AI that finds the errors. In this case, it's first a regular tool. So again, you see this kind of hybrid where there's like a mix of traditional tools and AIs. In this case, it's a traditional tool, um, but now the bug fix agent uh, fixes the bugs and it also kind of like explains exactly how it did. And I think that's one of the great things um, of these uh, AI models that they are pretty good at explaining um, what they do and how they do it. Um, all right, so now um, we can, like you know, can submit this thing into source control. Well, maybe not yet because not all the bugs are fixed, but let's can, run it again. Now it compi compiles, um, it uh, a test fails. Um, let's run the bug fix agent again. It explains why it, um, how it fixes it. Um, now all the tests pass um, and we're good. Um, the code looks ugly, so we can run the, um, the refactor agent. Again, the refactor agent could be like a, a traditional tool or it could be an AI. In this case, an AI tells us exactly what it does, this is the code it generates, looks good, submit, done. All right? So this is great. However, this workflow was designed by me. And what we want to do instead, as I said, like, you know, we want the AI to come up with this loop. Um, and so is that possible? So can we have an AI invent these workflows instead of like, you know, just doing the steps where we as a human uh, define the kind of overall control flow? Um, and to do that, um, there's many techniques. And one in particular is called React. Now, who here kind of like, you know, knows the old React or usually who is here is like a front end engineer? Um, okay, the few unlucky ones. Um, Every day there's a new JavaScript framework 
Um, and now Eric stands here and says, like, even your beloved React, you should forget about it. Because, guys and girls, there's a new React in town. And that's the one that you should learn. All right, so this React, that's old. Forget about it, irrelevant, doesn't matter anymore. This is the new React uh, that you need to learn. All right, so this new React is a way to, um, to let uh, AI models solve um, complicated problems. Um, and I'll go through this very quickly. Um, the only thing I wanted to show you here is that you see again, like, you know, there's this prompting going on where you really are begging the model to get, like, do things that you want, right? Like, you, you use capitals, like, you must do this or you must not do that. And this is not, again, a great way for humans to um, um, communicate with computers. But anyway, um, once we all do this, um, things work. But if you take a step back, what re this React um, technique does, it lets the program, the model, generate some weird program. And this weird program consists of these kind of like four kind of instructions. So there's the, the tool. So this is a gap where the model kind of says, oh, I think I need to use this tool. Then uh, they, what they call the input is like, what are the parameters that I need to pass to the tool? And then what you do is the implementation of this new React. What it does is it intercepts at that kind of boundary between the, the uh, green and the blue. It says, oh, now I, need to, I know what tool to use. I know what parameters to pass. I will step in and actually invoke the tool with those parameters and then give the answer to the model. So that's the observation. And then the model will go, oh, and now the next tool that I need to use is this. These are the parameters. Now you um, intercept again at the boundary of the green and the blue. You can like, make the call yourself and so on until you're done. Now, some of you that have like maybe programmed in Scheme or Haskell or Lisp recognize that what this technique is doing is really continuation passing style, right? You're kind of like, you know, you're intercepting right there. You're making the call and then you're kind of like, you know, calling the model as a continuation, passing it the observation that your tool made. So literally this React um, technique is continuation passing style. Um, so that is kind of, I think, quite nice. Um, everybody seems to be reinventing continu continuation passing style all the time, but here the AI folks have uh, reinvented it. But of course, as developers, we look at this code and say, it's kind of simple, this is just straight line code. So what if we could have a model generate arbitrary code? Because if we want to, um, um, automate like these larger workflows, straight line code is not like going to be powerful enough, right? It needs to generate while loops and conditionals and so on. Uh, how can we do that? So how can we make models generate arbitrary code? Um, and to do that, let's go back um, like a long time ago um, and let's look at um, what, what our forefathers and foremothers and whatever did um, in the olden days. Um, so in the olden days, um, if you look at, like this is the beginning of the web when people, this was called dynamic HTML, um, where you could embed scripts inside a, 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 an HTML page. Um, and in this case, I have a little script that um, does some computation, binds the result to variable A, and then mutates the, the, the page. Um, and then there's another script that runs, and this script also can, can refer to the state that was um, generated by the previous script, can update the page, and so on. 
Um, now, of course, we all take this for granted, all the React programmers, the old React programmers take this for granted. But um, once, long time ago, this was like a revolutionary, right? That we could have, like, that we could mix um, computation inside a web page and we could script the DOM um, in this way. And of course, everybody's now using notebooks, which uses the same ideas. Um, and in, in this case, um, for, for web pages, the uh, programming language is sandboxed or limited such that it cannot kind of escape its bounds and do bad things. All right. Now, if we want to now, what I want is to use this model to get, generate the code and then script like something else. Um, now, in 1999, I could use um, the Windows scripting host for that. Um, now it's 2023, um, so things have evolved, so we should be able to get, like, have a, a, a large choice, right? A large choice of, of like hostable scripting engines and so on. Um, but yeah, let's, let's look at what's going on here. So if I, if I look for the Windows script interface um, and I click on that thing, I get a um, page not found error. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit sad. Um, then I remember, uh, didn't Java have like some kind of like scripting host interface? So um, I look for that, oops. Withdrawn, cannot use it. Wow. So this is, um, we go back to this picture. This is why I think that like source control is kind of like a useless exercise that we're doing. So you, you've got kind of like, you know, I, I checked in my code um, in 1999, it all worked. And now I want to wake it up in 2023 and it doesn't work. And why is that? Because the world has changed. Um, all their, these implicit assumptions that I made that there was a scripting host, um, they, they don't hold anymore. So I, I think that it would be really nice if we could build a simpler source control system that doesn't kind of like allow us to go back in time because going back in time never works, right? So maybe if we built a source control system that maybe only solves like you know the fact that you can do like concurrent development and then this merge conflicts or something without having to ever go into the past things can be more simpler but that's another talk for another day um, but anyway I think it this kind of shows you that um, going back into the past typically doesn't work because the whole world changes and all these implicit dependencies then mess things up Anyway, going back to what we were looking for, we were looking for something where we could have like, you know, a, a, a script engine that we could embed somewhere. So after searching um, for a long time, I finally found something, and that is the Starlark interpreter that's used for the Bazel build system, um, and that allows you to, um, this can be embedded in the build system. Um, by the way, similar to um, previous here, as I said, like, you know, Kotlin, uh, scripting implements this for exactly the same reason for the Gradle build system where you can write your scripts in Kotlin. And so it seems to be that the only scripting hosts out there today are, are for build systems. Um, but anyway, um, the nice thing about um, Starlark is that it's a subset of Python. Um, and Python is the uh, most widely used or the, the, the most widely indexed language that these LLM, LLMs understand. So this is actually a good thing. So um, because the model now can generate um, Starlark because it's, it's close to Python. So there's a good chance that it, it does a good job. So let's look at um, this, um, this technique here. And this is like how I envision that we in the future um, like program these AI. So this is a high level language um, to kind of communicate for us humans to communicate with AIs. Um, so you can like, you know, you give it um, 
a specification in, in, in English, but it's not English, right? It's kind of some English with fragments of, of um, expressions in there. So Eric had A equals seven apples and A, B equals three of them. How many apples did Eric have left? And now the model executes that program by performing these assignment statements. And so it shows that these are the two variables that are in scope. And then it kind of like explains what it's going to do. It generates here a piece, a very simple piece of Starlark um, to compute how many apples are remaining. Um, I kind of like, you know, execute that. Then it shows like, you know, the new state. And then it kind of like, you know, tells you the answer. And um, so here what you see is that the uh, model acts in some sense like a JIT. It takes a high level program, it generates these fragments of code, um, and the next time I ask this question, it doesn't have to get, like, go through all these steps again. It can just, um, you can just take these fragments of code because it's all parameterized by those variables above. All right, so um, I'm, I'm running out of time, but this is also uh, the last slide of my talk. Um, as I said, I think this is the last few, I may, I, do I say months? I don't think it's months, but I also don't think it's years before our jobs will disappear. Um, we won't be writing code by hand. All the code that will be written will be written by models just like as, as if it's kind of like generating code for a, like assembly, like a JIT generates code for some processor. Um, these machines, these models will generate high level code, but we as humans um, are not going to write any more code. Um, but there's still plenty of work to do because all the software engineering problems that I kind of like, you know, hand waved away and was so happy that, that were gone, like all this, the processes, they're kind of like coming back in an even worse way. Um, I already told you that you have to back these models to do the right thing. Um, so they're very error prone. So it's very, very hard to make these models do the right thing. Um, and it's even harder to debug them. There's no like breakpoints or even printf. Um, so how are we going to get, like, you know, like debug the, the, the our prompts, how are we going to debug this interaction with these models? I don't know, but if we cannot solve that, um, I think we, we are in deep trouble. Um, it's also very brittle. Um, something that worked today doesn't work tomorrow. Now, of course, this is true for traditional software as well, um, but we're trying to solve this with versioning and so on, but in this case, um, the models just change or maybe they're stochastic so you cannot like they're very unstable so, so if, if like it worked on my machine will now be the universal truth because it worked on my machine but it doesn't work on your machine they're very insecure a lot of new attack vectors just look for prompt injection um, it's very hard to write that's why I'm, I'm thinking about new programming languages to to talk to these uh, models um, I already mentioned debugging. Uh, expensive. Um, if, if, you're, if you care about climate change and so on, um, just the, the amount of energy to train these models is, is enormous. And then um, the, the models uh, are trained on data and that data might leak. Um, and so you have to be very careful. So all, a lot of extra problems. Um, that are somehow familiar to us in the past, but are, are, are now like uh, show up in this new environment. So um, my main message here is that all our jobs will disappear, but new jobs will reappear like here. So if you, if you want to stick with the old React, uh, you will go the way of the dinosaur. So I think, but if you jump on the new React, you can ride the wave and, and you can get, like, you know, continue to pay your mortgage. But the traditional developer that we know today that sits behind their IDE and types code, 
I think it won't last more than, I would say, let's, let's make a bet. Um, let, let's, I'll bet $20, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a signed $20 bill, and I get $20 from all of you, so that's a great bet. <laughs> um, that a year from now, um, none of you will write code anymore by hand. Um, because look, and, and you can laugh, but look at, kind of like, you know, a year ago, ChatGPT came out. And now look at, like, how the world has changed. Just think about a year, maybe two years, and things will be even, even more different. Um, so um, thank you, and enjoy your last days as a traditional developer. <laughs>